How cool it is to be a part of this environment. You guys are really amazing. These testimonies are amazing. Your celebration is amazing. Really exciting. I feel so thankful to be part of this, be part of this place. So, okay, you're excited too, so I'm gonna have you guys all stand up. Real quick, stand up. Okay, first we're gonna put on our hand, follow me through this prayer, put your hand on your head, and say, thank you, Jesus, for my brilliant mind. Put your hand on your heart. Thank you, Jesus, for a healthy soul. Put your hand on your belly. Thank you, Jesus, for my supernatural spirit. And thank you for making me so good looking. Amen. You can have a seat. <laughs> so tonight, um, I want to talk to us a little bit about wholehearted living. That is such a big topic. It is not just a one evening topic, but I want to talk about some things that are going to catapult us into more wholehearted living. So what we're going to talk tonight about, what is wholehearted living? What can I do to live more wholeheartedly? And what would happen to me, my family, my church, and my world if I lived wholeheartedly? Something that is really amazing to me lately is I've just been thinking on a couple passages of scripture that I'll be talking about a little later is we have had the scriptures and the revelation of the Holy Spirit for about 2,000 years. We've had pop-up revivals. We've had men and women of God that have done amazing things and, and encounters with the presence of God over the years. But there's one thing that we've never yet successfully done, and that is past a revival and an experience with Holy Spirit onto the next generation. And as we really explore that and ask the Lord, why has that never happened? Like for 2,000 years, we've had this revelation of the whole New Testament. And sometimes I feel like, even though I've, I'm like in a hundredth generation Christian, I think, but in some ways I feel like I'm a first generation Christian. So much of the Bible, it's kind of like I'm like, oh, wow, you God, you're giving me a sword. Some revelations, it's like, I should have had, in a certain way, I'm not dogging any other generation before us, but it's like, I should have had a lot of this revelation or this understanding kind of like in my core already. And we're learning a lot of stuff now. So in that way, it's really amazing that we get to live in a time like this where it's actually being talked about on the planet that we're living in a sustained, we want to sustain this revival. We want to sustain community. We want to sustain family life where the next generation goes further with it, not where it drops off. And one of the big parts that we as a Christian body, as the bride of Christ, have not yet held on to, to pass on from generation to generation, is wholehearted living. And really knowing what that means to live like with our whole heart, to live in family, to live with emotions in a healthy way, to know what it is to take care of ourselves and our family, that they actually, like our experience with God, we actually pass it on to the next generation, to our kids and to the people around us. And we actually create an environment that's going to grow. And so this is extremely, this is why living in this very moment in history is so extremely exciting. So a couple things, aspects of this wholehearted living that we're going to talk about tonight is first of all, how our body, soul, and spirit all work together. And we're going to talk a little bit about thoughts and how important our thought life is to the way we live. So we're going to talk a lot about that like thought life aspect of wholehearted living. Um, I love how we all, you probably, all of you have heard that verse in Matthew 27. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and with all your strength. And I wonder if somehow 
we've been duped out of really living, deep thinking, creative thinking, authentic living of what Jesus intended, what that meant. So tonight, we're going to talk about um, our heart and our soul and our brain. Because everything that we take in, every bit of experience or every information that we receive, at first, we receive it in through our heart. That's why everything we have an emotional memory about. First, you have a feeling about it. So everything we experience, we experience it first through our heart, then it filters our soul. Um, our heart consists of our, our mind, will, and emotions. So that's all like the innards of us, like the core of who we are. That part is the first thing that experiences anything. And then our mind is actually what tells our brain what to think about it. Our brain is actually separate from our mind. So our mind, which is part of our soul, actually tells our brain what to think about it. Our brain is a processor. It always has to come up with a plan. Whatever you're going through, your brain needs to figure out what you should do and what needs to happen. Constantly processing. Your soul is taking everything in, deciding what it feels about it, what it believes about it. And our spirit um, is a part of us that connects to God. That's like a part, the part of us like, that's intuitive and communing with God. So those are the three parts of us. And they all have to work together really well for you to thrive, for you or me to thrive. They all have to be working really well together and in sync. Um, funny thing, though, that what happens is in the course of our life, when we have like negative experiences and hurtful things happen to us, we actually begin to shut down. The first part of us that we usually will begin to shut down is our heart. Because it's too painful. So our brain will send messages to our heart and tell it to just shut down and please be quiet. Because our, our brain doesn't know what to do with it anymore. <laughs> It has, our brain is a processor, it has to know what to do with stuff. But when it's no longer, when it's too painful and it doesn't know what to do with stuff, it tells our hearts to shut down. And then what happens is a really amazing thing starts happening in our, our brain is when we hear a positive word, actually the first thing we think of, if we're unhealed, if, you're an, if we have an unhealed mind, the first thing that we'll think of or associate it with is something negative. So for example, if we're unhealed in our heart and have had a lot of negative experiences, the first thing that somebody hears of when they hear the word obey is they hear the word spanking or punishment. If they hear the word prosperity, the first thing they think of is, the first emotion they'll feel is jealousy. If an unhealed heart hears the word God, it will feel shame. If an unhealed heart hears the word love, it'll feel rejection. So we actually project the opposite on things that are good. Um, something that we often really struggle with in, as Christians, and we're in this wanting to renew our minds, right? We're all like, yeah, we're on this path to renew our minds. And um, one thing that is a tool and we're encouraged to do in that process of renewing our mind is declarations. And I know a lot of people say, you know what, I say these declarations over and over and over again, but nothing is changing. Why is nothing changing? Did you ever say a declaration over yourself and all you felt was like that, the brick wall? And you're like, I feel like I could say this a hundred times and nothing will ever change. Well, we're gonna address tonight the tools that you can use to change, to renew our mind and why that happens. Um, when we're not even self-aware of what's going on inside of us, like what is self-awareness? Self-awareness is not I'm being all introspective and I'm all being about me, me, me all the time. Self-awareness is simply, hey, I know what's going on inside me, I know what's going on around me, I know what season I'm in. It's kind of like when you wake up in the morning and you know it's winter time, so you know you need to put on a coat today. You know you're not going to wear your shorts. That's self-awareness. You're knowing what's going on inside your heart. How am I feeling? Am I having anxiety? Am I having fear? Or am I living in peace? Self-awareness. 
Um, and another thing when we're renewing our minds tonight, when we're talking about this whole process, I want us to walk through this process being aware that it's really good if Holy Spirit picks out like one thought pattern that you have that you know is negative, or as we call it, toxic, like some thought pattern that you know, I know this doesn't line up with the Word of God. I just feel like I'm not good enough. I feel like God isn't protecting me. So we all maybe have a lot of those, but it's really healthy to just pick out one to start with. So as we're walking through tonight, you can, if Holy Spirit maybe shows one to you, one that maybe bugs you the most and annoys you the most, start with one at a time. So pick one, and we're just going to ask God tonight that he's going to just transform and begin giving you tools how to work on transforming that thought process into something really healthy. So what are thoughts? Do you know what thoughts are? I used to think thoughts were just like my random like little thoughts, invisible, just flying around there. Who knows what things? But you know what? Thoughts are actually real things in your brain that are actually taking up real, real estate. They are ever-changing cells in your brain that are constantly moving and changing shape depending on what you're thinking about. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures. This is actually a picture, a real scientific like picture of what your thoughts look like in your brain. They are actually a real deal thing. Now, do you see those, um, do you see the tall trees that look like trees standing up and all those things sticking out? Every time that you have a thought, you grow more of those little branches. Every time. Every time. So tonight, you're growing like a whole nother tree. <laughs> but it's up to you which kind of tree you want to grow because there's two kinds of trees. Every time we have positive thoughts and we're engaged, that would, anything that would be positive would be like loving thoughts or thoughts of passion and interested and feeling like excited. You're going to grow a thought that looks like the trees that are tall and then have all those like branches growing out. Every time you have a negative thought, do you see those dark? Do you see that dark cluster at the bottom? Every time you have a negative thought and you feel emotionally pain, you feel like I'm not good enough, I hate them, um, this is so unfair, I'm afraid. Anytime you feel like that, you grow a thought tree that is dark and dry and brittle. The most amazing thing about thoughts is that the, the healthy ones, every time you send a thought to your brain, you're, it's a, a little electric pulse. And when your electric pulse hits the cell in your brain, it secretes a chemical and it builds one of those branches. When you think healthy thoughts, those chemicals release all the happy hormones that we love. Do we not love happy hormones? Feeling happy, feeling content, excited, our endorphins and all that. Every time you think any, if any time you think a negative thought, that thought sets an electrical, electric pulse to your brain, but your brain has no system to receive that. So it starts stealing, um, it starts stealing the hormones and the uh, chemicals from the other trees to grow a tree and it starts whack, getting everything out of whack. Like it does too much, releases too much hormones, all that kind of stuff, and actually starts to become inflamed. So that part of your brain actually starts becoming inflamed, starts agitating your brain, depression, anger, all kinds of stuff starts happening. So interesting, is it not? That when God said, think only on things above, praise me always, he wasn't just like, he, he wired our brains for love. There is no system in our body that knows how to handle fear or rejection 
or anger or hostility. Our body goes into chaos when it tries to handle that stuff. And that's why everything goes um, imbalanced, inflamed, and we begin to have health problems or other things like that. Amazing. But the other amazing thing is there is enough space in your brain that if you lived to be a million years old, you still would not take up all your real estate of your brain. They're, they are so small and there's so much space in your brain. You can be as intelligent as you want to be. Did you know that? You can be as smart and intelligent as you want to be. The more trees you grow, the, the smarter you get. It's up to you if you want to like, it's up to you if you want to do like deep thinking and if you want to start developing your mind, it's up to you, but you can. Everybody has the same capacity for intelligence. Is that not amazing? Everybody has the same capacity. Now, what if we have these like bad trees? I'll call them bad trees. So what if we have trees that are dark and are re causing inflammation and are releasing like an overdose of hormones, everything's whacked out, what do we do then? It's so cool because God made that any, everything in our life can be restored. So no matter what has happened in your life, everything can be restored, including your mind. You decide what your mind thinks. Your mind tells your brain what to think. And every single tree that is one of those brittle trees that was developed out of toxic thoughts, every one of those trees can be melted down and regrown into a healthy tree. And so how do we do that? How do we do that? That's the process the Bible talks about, like renewing our mind, taking every thought captive. And when you, when you start to say, I'm going to be really self-aware of what I'm thinking, I really want to know if the thoughts that I'm thinking are good or bad. That starts a whole process of changing your entire brain. Because the way your brain looks, that's the way your life looks. A toxic brain is going to be a toxic life. A healthy brain is going to be a healthy life. So what do we do if we have toxic trees. Actually, they say, um, psychologists say that if you are a normal average person, 70% of your thoughts are negative. Now, by God's grace, if we're saved and we're renewing our mind, hopefully it's better than that. 70% of those toxic thoughts are subconscious <laughs> that you're not even aware of. So you can have these trees in your subconscious mind and you're not even aware of it. Like, these are like forests and forests and forests in our minds. So what do we do? We have all this stuff going on. Well, God has a plan how we can melt down any kind of these toxic trees and rebuild. And I bet you guys could guess what it takes to melt down a toxic tree. Holy Ghost fire. <laughs> Holy Ghost fire and Holy Ghost encounters and positive forgiveness and positive experiences and the way God wanted us to live and the way God wanted us to think. So actually, it takes four days, and we know that God can do suddenlies, right? Yeah. Like God just did a suddenly for, for Veronica Papali. Definitely can do that. But it takes four days to melt down one of those toxic trees with positive experiences with God. And you know what, so much of that happens, it would be wild, I bet, if we knew what was happening inside of our brains on a worship night. When we are just sinking and soaking into the goodness of God and letting him encounter us and feeling it, taking the time to meditate on it and feeling it. When you meditate on God's goodness and you experience it, you have to experience it. It's not a, oh yeah, God loves you. It's an experience and you feel it. That's when the hormones are released that melt down that toxic tree. And that's then when you, with positive thoughts, with healthy, holy thoughts, you rebuild new trees. Pretty amazing. This is stuff that I learned from a woman called Dr. Caroline Leaf. She wrote a book called Who Switched Off My Brain? 
And it talks about how our brain literally needs to be activated on with good, holy, wholesome thoughts. Have you ever felt like, have you ever had that feeling like, I just feel like I'm living under my potential? Do you ever have that feeling like, I feel like there's so much more creativity in there and it's not coming out, what's hindering me? I felt that way a lot. And it's like, this is the stuff that's keeping us. And Satan's lied to us to empower those broadcasts that we believe it. And now we can say, no, I'm going to believe the truth. I can melt down every toxic tree with encounters with the love of God. Oh. Um, just having a wonderful conversation with one of my sisters just a little while ago. And one of the most difficult things in our life, when we've had like hurtful things happen, We've all had hurtful things happen. Like really, those hurtful things that you're like, God, why didn't you stop that? That kind of hurtful. Like, why didn't you keep that from happening? That was really hurtful. That felt really over the top hurtful. And sometimes those are the things that we actually have a hard time. Um, not that we need to forgive God, but releasing God from our judgment. Like we judged God in those moments. Like, why didn't you protect me from that? Like, you're such a loving God. Why didn't you protect me in that moment? And sometimes those thoughts, you know, God must not be that loving, must not be protect that protecting. Sometimes those thoughts are, make up those toxic trees because we feel like, God, you just must not be that loving. And when God gives us the revelation and the truth that he is such a caring God, that when that happened to you, he was not sitting there on his throne like, I'll just keep my eye on that, but too bad. That he was actually right next to you and crying and angry, and he wanted to punch that person, <laughs> but because he said, I create this world with free will, I won't. That because I give my, ch the, Children that I made, I just said, I'm going to give them free will to love or not to love. I'm not going to intervene and stop them right now. But he's mad and he's sad. And I just encourage you, if there's any memory that you're still having a hard time healing from or understanding why didn't God stop that from happening, is you sit with Holy Spirit or Jesus or Father God sometime and you say, what were you feeling when that happened? What were you feeling, Father God, when that was happening to me? And I can guarantee you, you'll see some emotion. Because when the enemy is hurting his kids, he's not just sitting there okay. He is emotionally involved. And you know what? Knowing that God cared in that moment is so healing. And when you let God care about the really tough stuff that happened to you, you'll start seeing your heart heal. Because you'll see that really mattered to, my that mattered to my Heavenly Father that that happened to me. That really mattered to him. He cared. But he chose not to intervene because he said, I'm giving my kids free will to love or not to love pretty powerful isn't it when we see that God loves us so much that he said I give you the choice to love or not to love those around you That's one of the things that I like really love about what we do, what we've learned from um, Sozo. You guys have heard a lot about Sozo, stuff like that. It's starting to feel like a familiar word by now, maybe. But that's one of the reasons I love about what God does in a Sozo is because his presence comes and he says, he shows up and he sa he'll tell you how okay, how not okay he was with that. And he'll tell you what he really felt and what he really thought about that situation that you went through. And yes, 
I heard somebody say the word, it is so validating to know that our Heavenly Father, that he cared, that he wasn't just standing there aloof, but he cared. And it wasn't him doing it. It was not him doing it. But he gives us choices who we partner with. There's a really cool passage that you all, um, that we're all probably pretty familiar with. But I was just like spending time with God, just myself processing through, I want to detox my mind. And in our fast, one of the things that God asked me to detox in my mind is um, if only statements. Because I realize I can tend to be a person who really can dwell on my regrets, thinking that I'm just taking good assessment of myself, I'm just being real, or I'm just... But really, it's living in regret, and it's living in guilt and shame of what I didn't do in the past, whether it's one second ago, or 20 years ago, or 40 years ago. And the Lord asked me to fast, if only statements. And along with if only statements comes, I should have, I could have, if only, if only I had done this, if only. And I know we can be tormented by if only statements, if only, if only. I know that when I was a little kid, if only I had less brothers and sisters, I would feel loved. <laughs> it's like, what does that have to do with it? But you, you have so many like, if onlys. If only I could get a new couch, then I'd feel really good when I'm entertaining people. I wouldn't feel embarrassed. If only I were taller, then I could reach the baskets in the kitchen for the bread. Like, <laughs> and I won't always have to be in the front row when we get our pictures taken. <laughs> Anybody relating. <laughs> but the enemy can torture us and torment us with like, oh, if only I would have, I could have, I should have. But we can learn how to turn them into like, you know what? But this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. I'm too short to re reach the bread basket in the kitchen when it's time to set it for the bread. But I'm going to use that as a fun way to get other people involved. So I asked Ryan to get the bread basket for me. I use that as an experience. Now I can use community. I can build community. I can build relationship because I have to ask people to get stuff for me. What are we going to do about stuff? What are we going to make? What are we going to change? What do we want to do and turn it into a positive? Um, Philippians 4. I tell you, if we ever wondered if God like wanted us to live in emotion at all, this is a good way to kind of find out. Don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will make the answers known to you through Christ Jesus. So keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising him always. Fasten. Fix, fasten, fix, fasten, fix, fasten, fix your thoughts on what is good. Wow. So now when we go to do a declaration and we feel like we hit a brick wall, we say, God, Show me if there's anybody I need to forgive. And then, Father God, show me how I need to take care of myself 
for example, really popular one people have a really, really difficult time with, with declarations is, I am worthy of love. Really simple one. Without feeling worthy of love, we don't have wholehearted living, right? So sometimes we don't feel like we're worthy of unconditional love. So we look in the mirror and we say the statement, I am worthy of love. Maybe you feel that brick wall feeling. But we say, Father God, I am going to today, I'm going to take care of myself and I'm going to show myself love. I'm going to start by showing myself love. And I'm going to start by inviting you, Father God, to show me your love. And I'm going to intentionally sit in your love. Did you ever have somebody give you a compliment and it felt so uncomfortable? Even though you were like, oh, thank you, thank you. But inside it felt so weird and uncomfortable inside. That's the feeling that we sit in. That's love. And when you're not used to being okay with love, that's the feeling that you got to sit in. When God gives you the compliment, you're beautiful. You are my son. You are my daughter. I love you and I want you. And you're like, oh, yeah, but look, they're so much cooler. Oh, everybody else at church, they're so much better. Oh, they're so much more talented. He says, no, I want you and I love you. And I'm looking at you right now. That's the moment that you have to sit in that feeling. What does that feeling feel like? Can you, can you kind of remember what that feeling feels like? And if you're healed, that would feel good. If you're not all the way healed, that might feel really uncomfortable. There'll be all these buts. <laughs> like, but, I'm not as cool as they are, but I'm not as talented as they are. I must not be as fun to spend time with as they are. And he says, no, you're the one I want to spend time with. You're the one I want to be with. And you just say, I choose to sit in that. And I choose to receive it. Because it's truth. Fasten, fix. Fasten, fix. And when the enemy says, oh no, you can't fasten, you can't fix, uh uh, you say, yes, I will fasten, I will fix, I will experience Father God, I will hear his voice. What brings so much healing is when we hear the relational voice of God. Do you know what the relational voice of God is? That's when you hear him speaking to you in that moment about that moment. That's when you take a worry and a care to God. That's when you take a care to God and you say, God, what do you think about this care? What do you think about this worry? What are you going to do about this worry? Man, I've been having trouble sleeping at night. I'm just like so tired. What if I can't do everything I'm supposed to do? What if I'm not able to teach? Father God, what are you going to do about this worry? And he says to me, I'm going to make sure you get enough sleep. And you need to do your part to keep your, your mind in peace and at rest. What am I going to do about my kids? Oh my goodness. Okay, your brain wants to process, right? He's got to come up with a plan. He's coming up with a plan. Because your mind's like, I got to figure this out. Your mind is telling your brain, we got to figure something out here. We got to fix this. What do we do? We stop and we say, Father God, what do you want to do about my kids? And you sit there and you wait for an answer. You wait until you hear and you feel his words. It's never easy. Renewing the mind is, isn't like an instantaneous thing. It takes work, but it can so be done. Dr. Um, Leaf, who did, she's a Christian um, neuroscience. So she is so great because she says how, you know what, God is the author of scripture and of science. So why would we not want to like study both? And it's amazing how they connect up. How God made us wired for love. We're not wired for fear. If we knew how dangerous fear, fear thoughts were, we'd be a lot more careful. 
because they bring so much damage to us. But our positive thoughts bring so much life. We are wired for love. Everything about our body thrives on love, thrives on feeling a part of things, thrives on belonging. Philippians 4, we read it already, chapter, um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faithful request to God with overflowing gratitude, telling him every detail of your life. If you ever are going through your life and you're like, what's the formula to get my mind on track? Remember Philippians 4. Philippians 4, verse 8 through 6 through 8. It's almost like this bullet point, how to live with a healthy mind. Having a healthy mind is part of like wholehearted living. Big part of wholehearted living. Because what, what our heart tells our mind is what our mind tells our brain, and then our brain is what our life is gonna be made of. Really interesting thing too about in Philippians 4, when Paul wrote that, um, that book, that was a, a time um, in the Roman Empire. Remember how Greeks were very influential even in Roman Empire because Alexander the Great had conquered all of the known world at the time. So Greeks were very influential. And during that time, philosophy, philosophers, were very big and very influential in culture, all of culture. And there was one philosophy, one thought of philosophy, it was called the Stoics. And what they believed and what they taught is that you need to empty out your life of emotion. You need to behave correctly, but not feel a thing. It was so sadistic that the way they taught this is you would start with, okay, first how about I throw out a fork? Oh, first I'll throw out my little remote control picture thing. Okay, I'm fine with that. I can be happy without that. Oh, next I'll throw out, okay, I'll throw out all my, my shoes. Okay, throw out my shoes. No more shoes. I can still behave well. I'm fine. Shut down your emotions. Don't grieve. Don't be upset about it. Okay. Next, that's I reached the next level. Okay. How about a pet? What do I do if a pet dies? No emotion. I can still behave fine. Not be sad. Next step. What if a person dies? What if somebody in my family dies and I still feel no emotion and still can behave well? That was a very influential thought of philosophy at the time. And Paul was reteaching their minds that no, God is not telling you to empty out your heart of emotion. God is telling you to lead your emotions by your spirit. Remember, we're three parts. We're body, soul, and spirit. If our spirit is the leader, our soul and our mind will be healthy because our spirit is the part that connects to God. So if we're keeping good connection to God, then our emotions will be healthy. But there was such a thought, such a broadcast in the culture at the time that emotions are bad. And that same broadcast creeps up a lot of times in religious cultures and religious spirits. And I can identify with that in even the culture that I grew up in. What's in here is bad. So just keep it shut. Because the minute you open that up, it's like you're going to be overwhelmed with negativity, jealousy, hatred, all this stuff's going to come out, and that's really bad. So just keep it all, just don't even. <laughs> just keep it all quiet. And it's like, that's not who God is. God is such a God of joy and such a God of emotion that I just dare us to find out how powerful, how good, and how right 
but how strong his emotions are, how his love, how strong his love is for you. And when we know that his love for us is that big and that strong, then we can enter into wholehearted living because we know that we're safe. Amen. So if you guys would just stand up with me. Another thing that's amazing about our minds, when we engage our spirit, it's like our brain, our brain grows, our brain becomes more intelligent. Cool things like when we speak in tongues, our spirit man grows, our spirit man is strengthened, we become wiser, we grow in discernment. Everything the way God wired us is that we just become more and more and more. Did you know the older you get, the more capacity you have for intelligence? It's not diminishing. Unless it's full of toxic thoughts, then yeah. But if you're renewing your mind and you're growing trees of thought that are healthy and fresh, you actually grow wiser, smarter, more intelligent. That's your capacity. So, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you wired us for love, that you created us for intelligence that is never capped. Thank you, God, that you created us for creativity that is never capped. It is endless. Thank you, God, that your emotions for us are powerful and they are strong. And I invite you, Holy Spirit, to draw us into your heart into your heart of strong emotions, that we would no longer be afraid of our emotions, but we would let you an, enter our spirit and that our connection with you would guide our emotions and would guide our thoughts. So we, so we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you want us to live wholeheartedly, that you want us to live fully, and that your plans for us are good and creative and powerful, intelligent thoughts. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.